G'day all, welcome to another video. So I want to continue talking about caches today and uh, we'll talk about cache lines and how they helped us last time at the end of last vid. Then we'll talk about cache blocking and we'll have a bit of a look at cache blocking in C++. Okay, cache lines. So when the CPU requests data from RAM, it actually requests blocks called cache lines and they are 64 bytes wide. Um, yeah, it does this because if you want one variable from RAM, just the patterns of programming uh, would statistically suggest that you're probably going to want the next variable or maybe the previous variable. Yeah, we tend to use data that's close together. So CPUs grab cache lines instead of single variables. And the CPU stores them in lines in cache as well. So the CPU never, it never reads a single byte from RAM and it doesn't store single bytes in its cache. It always deals with these cache lines. All right, so the cache, the cache lines are just um, numbered zero through to 80 billion or whatever. Um, the first one starts at zero, address number zero in RAM, and it goes all the way up to byte number 63. And then the next cache line starts at byte number 64 and goes all the way up to byte number 127. So if you want to figure out what cache line a byte belongs to, then you can just divide its address by 64 and discard the remainder. All right, the cool thing about cache lines is that if you read two bytes in the same cache line, you'll get one cache miss for reading the first byte, uh, but then you'll probably get a cache hit since the whole line is brought into cache. It doesn't matter if you're operating forwards or backwards, cache lines are still going to give you the benefit. So if you've read this entire cache line into cache, uh, it doesn't matter if you're iterating through an array forwards or if you're going backwards, you're still going to get cache hits. But how did it help us with our matrix product? Well, this is what was happening in the first example, the slower example of our matrix product. To compute this value just here in the matrix product, what we need to do is get the dot product of the row from matrix A and the column from matrix B. And if we store the data in such a way that the rows elements are all beside each other, uh, it's fine to read the row what will end up happening, we'll read a cache line and we'll get a cache miss for the first cache uh, byte <laughs> for the first element of the array. But then for the remainder of the cache line, the whole line is in cache. So that'll be fast. We'll get miss, hit, hit, hit. And then we'll have to read another cache line. Miss, hit, hit, hit. Miss, hit, hit, hit. Miss, hit, hit, hit. So these diagrams are drawn as though cache lines are four bytes, but in reality, they're 64 bytes. The trouble is if it's if the data is stored to read rows, uh, it's probably not stored to read it in columns. And this is what happens if you try and read the columns of a matrix that's stored in row major. You get a cache miss and you read the rest of the cache line, but you don't use it. You go down and you read the next element of the column. You get a miss and you read the rest of the cache line, but you don't use it. You go down and you get another cache miss. You don't use the rest of the cache line. You go down and you get another cache miss. So what you can see is happening. The entire column is nothing but a string of cache misses and reading these cache lines and not using the data. So that's actually why the first uh, example was slow. Yeah, it's just a whole bunch of cache misses and we're not using the data that we're reading in the cache lines. And the solution is to transpose. So this is what I was doing at the end of last video. I just transposed one of the well, I transpose all of the matrices. Um, I store the data twice. So once in row major form, which is a convenient way to read the data in rows, but then I copied the data and stored it in column major form, or a convenient way to read the data in columns. Um, you'll notice now in this second matrix, this uh, axes have swapped. Instead of X and Y, it's now Y and X. So this is still reading down a column, even though I've strangely and inexplicably drawn it um, <laughs> going to the right hand side. It's going down a column. Um, now, if we want to compute the dot product of this little value just here, we've got a convenient way to read the rows. We just read the row major version of the data. And we've also got a convenient way to read the column. We read the column version of the matrix B data. So the reason why the second uh, matrix product was so much faster is just because we're using cache lines more conscientiously. Uh, the data is being read from RAM we might as well use it. So really the take home, the take home message here, the take home message is um, try to work on your data in consecutive bytes or blocks or addresses. Uh, you don't want to be jumping around. You don't want to be jumping around. It's just too slow. You get cache misses all the time. 
Blocking is another technique. This is uh, more closely, I guess, to do with caches than cache lines, but it's all, it's all related. So blocking is where we hope to grab a, a large problem like your matrix product, and we want to split it into smaller problems such that the data that we're working on at any one time fits into cache. Yeah, that's the idea. Sort of a divide and conquer, I guess. Cache thrashing and pollution. Uh, all right, so the reason why we want to do that is because of cache thrashing and cache pollution. Uh, we want to avoid these things. These are not good. If you think about the matrix product, what you've got to do to compute this first row of the product, uh, you've got to read the first row of matrix A, but you've got to compute the dot product with every single column of matrix B. So that's going to mean that the entire matrix B is going to be read. And if matrix B doesn't fit into cache, and in our example it doesn't, I mean this is um, a thousand by a thousand and doubles, this is, would it be like eight megabytes? Um, you got trouble because at the end of this uh, row just here, what we'll have in cache is just this final column. Maybe, in theory, I don't know. I don't know what it'll actually be in cache, but it'd be something, it'd be something like that. Uh, that's cache pollution, since we're just about to jump over here to the right-hand side, the left-hand side, sorry, and uh, compute the next row, and we're going to need this first column. But this first column's not in cache anymore. All that's in cache is this last column. So cache pollution is whenever we've got data that's cached that we don't want it to be. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And cache thrashing is to repeatedly fill the cache with data and not use it. Um, we're using it a little bit in this matrix product, but if you can imagine something like stepping through an array, say you've got an array of like three gigabytes or whatever, uh, if you're just step stepping through that array, what's going to happen is all of the data is going to go into cache, it'll stick around for a while, then it'll get evicted. You're not using any of the data, um, it's just going in and out, in and out, and that's cache thrashing, you're just repeatedly filling the entire cache and not using the data. That's good, but let's talk about blocking. So instead of computing the first row, what we can do is um, just compute this little block just here. So in order to compute these 16 little values just here, um, you just need these first four rows and these first four columns. So so long as those first four rows fit into cache and those first four columns, we can compute all 16 of these values in cache, which would be very, very nice. Give us a good speed up. And once we're done computing that little block, we move on to the next one. You see, so this is, this is really the trick. This is what blocking is all about. It's just about organizing things differently, um, computing things in a different order such that we can hopefully better use our cache. I want to say that it's nothing more than adding a couple of extra nested for loops um, in terms of matrix product anyway. So we'll have a bit of a look at that. Now we'll have a look in C++ and see if we can get it to work. Okay, so I think I think this is the um, program that we had last time. I don't know though. And also, I don't know if this is actually going to speed anything up. Um, yeah, well, it's not quick anyway. Uh, I've got a screen recorder going, so that doesn't help. Uh, but this is our matrix multiplication just here. We've got our three nested for loops, row, column, and dot. Uh, I think this was the second example, so this is probably using that um, transposed matrix that we talked about to use the cache lines better. But hopefully we can add some blocking. So what did that take? About two seconds, I think it was. What was the time? Yeah, we'll just say two seconds. So one of the things that you've got to be um, aware of is that the block size uh, in this particular example, I'm just going to set it to 100. This should be a multiple of the matrix size. Um, you can pad your matrices and use sort of standardized block sizes, but for this example, I'm just going to make it 100 because I know that my matrix is 1,000 by 1,000. Yeah, you'd have to be a lot more careful about all of this stuff if it was production code. And the other thing I want to say is that you've got to tweak this block size. There's no amount of reading that you can do that's going to tell you um, what to set the block size to. I mean, you can read up how big your caches are, how fast they are, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the only way to know how quickly it runs is to push it through some real hardware and see, you know, see what happens. All right, that's good, Creole. Let's do some, uh, let's do some block and four int. Uh, I got like a row block, block row or row block. I might say block row. Uh, it's going to equal... 
uh, row while well, block row is less than row plus block size. Block row plus plus. Okay, let's just, um, nice one. I'm always fighting with uh, Visual Studio. Every new version that comes out, I'm fighting with it, trying to get it to do the tabbing and everything that I like. But I think this is working right now, so nobody touch it. Don't touch it. Don't. All right, four. Int block col. I might just copy this, actually, because I'm lazy. And then I'll change these to block col. Copy and paste is such a bad idea. I'm always copying and pasting and you run into trouble. You know, you copy this, that and the other and then you leave out one or two little changes that you should have fixed. And it's pretty hard to find. Okay. Okay, so I've just added another two nested for loops. These for loops just here are counting along the edge of the little block. Little block. And when we're counting up in our row, uh, now we can move it in blocks. So we're no longer just stepping up in, in ones, we're stepping up in blocks. So we'll change this to block size. Likewise for the columns, um, we're counting downwards in blocks as well. So this would be block size as well. This has to now change to block row. Um, and this one to block column. And likewise, when we're setting the values now, we've got to use block row and block column. But that should just about be it. So we're at two seconds before. Let's see what we're doing now. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a fair bit faster. It's a fair bit faster. Yeah, there you go. So it's about twice as twice as fast. So that's a pretty decent speed up, especially considering that we've also got that's that's multiplied by the speed up that we got from the cache lines from before. But we've been through cache lines and we've been through cache blocking. Uh, maybe we want to talk about prefetching next. That's a good topic as well. We'll probably jump into assembly for that. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good one.